In this section, we'll continue with our discussion of the role of examples and models. All right, first things first. Any mathematical system will always have some statements which we assume without proof. Uh, we call these axioms. So basically the idea here is that like you can't, you can't prove everything. You have to have some basic underlying assumptions. And the assumptions that we're starting with are gonna be called axioms, right? Uh, how do we choose what axioms we're going to throw into our system? Well, there are three things that we use to choose here. Um, so they're usually chosen A for their convenience and efficiency. Uh, convenience, um, uh, usually, usually this will just mean like mm, that it's, it's convenient to just like make this assumption about um, about our world so that we can like prove things with them um, and sometimes we'll uh, want them to also be efficient too so like the, the idea with axiom is like uh, is that you want to prove things from these axioms so um, if, if it's convenient to be able to prove things with like one set of axioms instead of a different set of axioms then that might be some reason to choose that set and if like you only need to um, assume one axiom to uh, be able to prove a bunch of other things in a really efficient way, then maybe you would just like pick that axiom instead. So, um, so convenience and efficiency, usually with regards to like proving things and building up your system. And then B, they're chosen for their consistency. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I basically mean that um, you can build up a model for your um, for your axiomatic system that is free of contradictions. Um, so I'll talk more about this one later. Uh, sometimes there's chosen C for their plausibility, how likely it is that we think that it's true. Right. Um, All right, axioms must always have some undefined terms, such as points and lines in geometry. And generally, we first decide what our undefined terms are going to be, and then we decide the axioms to describe properties of the undefined terms. So you might naively think that we should um, define our uh, define things like points and lines first and then from those definitions we can start proving things from them but it turns out to just be more useful to just not even give a definition to points and lines and then just say like what certain properties of them are like um like what how would you define a point how would you define a line um without having to already have some pre-built-in assumptions about what your world looks like uh, it's just easier to just say, well, all right, I know that two lines should intersect in uh, at most one point, so that's going to be one of my axioms. So that's going to be a property of lines that I'm going to be able to work with and prove things from. Okay, uh, models. We've already seen models, um, but I and I've been using this term, um, but I haven't actually told you what exactly it is. A model for an axiomatic system is an example or realization of the undefined terms uh, such that all of the axioms hold true. So we take all of our undefined terms and we interpret them in some concrete way and we have to make sure that all of the axioms are satisfied when we do this. And if all of those axioms are satisfied, um, then we have created a model for that axiomatic system. So here's an example here. Uh, this is a really very basic one. So our abstract system on the left here has two axioms. Uh, right away, you might be wondering uh, what do these symbols right here mean? Um, this symbol stands for there exists, or like there are, or there is. It's just, it's just an existence symbol, okay? So 
the first axiom says there are two points in the system. There exists two points. And then the second axiom says there exists a line containing those two points. So a model describing this system could look like the following. So you have a point here and a point here, and then you just have a line connecting them. So you have point A, point B, and then a line. So there are uh, two points, and there is a line containing those two points. So this model right here satisfies this abstract axiomatic system. Okay, so this, so this is in fact a model. Like I said, we've already seen models in previous videos. Um, in section 2.1, we saw this axiomatic system. Um, so this system in the top left here was described by three axioms. Axiom 1 said that each line contains exactly four points. Axiom 2 said that each point lies in exactly two lines. And axiom 3 said that two distinct lines intersect in at most one point. Right? So lines contain four points, points are in two lines, uh, lines intersect in a point, or not at all. And then we found two models for this system. Our first model was this 4x4 four four grid here, and our second model was this fractal pattern. Um, one weird thing that I, I just want to mention, um, it's not that important, uh, but I think it's worth worth noting, um, is that models can look very different while still being the same. Um, so with this model right here, I could just draw um, these lines really weird, but like this model is still effectively the same as this model on the left, right? There's nothing like really different between these two models. Um, so effectively, even though they look kind of different, they are still the same. Uh, there is a notion of what it means for two models to be the same. Um, and uh, I'm not going to get too deep into well, like what exactly that means, but just, just keep in mind that models can look different while still being the same. This model, on the other hand, is uh, effectively very different from this model. Uh, and the reason being, well, they, they have properties which are just completely different. For example, this model has exactly 16 points in it. This model, on the other hand, has infinitely many points. So that is a very um, different property that these two models do not share. Um, so because I found a property that these two models don't share, these models are uh, different. Uh, no matter no matter what our um, well maybe I shouldn't say no matter what our notion of the same is, but um, for any reasonable interpretation of what it means for two models to be the same. Okay, so anyway, moving on from that, uh, there are, there are two things that we want our axiomatic systems to have, uh, and those two properties are independence and consistency. We want our axiomatic systems to be independent and consistent. What does that mean? So uh, a system is consistent if we can construct a model that satisfies all of its axioms and has no contradictions. Okay. Um, so we can just come up with some sort of model uh, for it that is free of contradictions. Um, and if, if nothing, nothing terrible happens, then uh, then we're then we're good. Um, so like going back up to this, this is a consistent system because I can build um, I can build different models for it which satisfy all of these axioms and there's nothing wrong. Nothing went wrong in creating these models here. So that was a consistent axiomatic system. Uh, was it an independent system? That's a harder question to ask. Um, so a system is independent if no axiom can be proven using the other axioms. So let's say that we had three axioms, axiom one, axiom two, and axiom three. And let's suppose that 
we have a proof that um, the following statement is true. So if we assume a1 and a2 are true, then necessarily a3 must be true. So suppose that this is just a true statement, if a1 and a2, then a3, then this would not be an independent system because one axiom can be proved using the other axioms. Okay, And so if you can prove a3 from the axioms a1 and a2, there is no sense in having a3 in our system. So we would just throw A3 out of our system. We would just get rid of it altogether because A3 is true. It's still gonna be true in our system, but we don't need to assume it. There's just like no need to. You could assume it. It's true. It's not gonna change anything. Um, but generally speaking, like um, you want your, axio your axiomatic system to have as few axioms as possible because like if you're just trying to prove as many things as possible from like from your axioms it's better to have only like five or six axioms than like 20 or 30 axioms where like uh where like 10 or 20 of them can be proven using the original five it, it just like there's no point so you want it to be independent um this leads into a really interesting and important discussion about the parallel postulate. So the parallel postulate is one of the most important and famous axioms uh, in geometry. Uh, and it says the following. It says that um, for, for a line L, so here's the line L, and for a point P, not on that line, there exists, so there exists a unique line L prime such that P lies in L prime and L prime is parallel to L. Uh, and so I will draw L prime right now. So L prime is just some line that goes through P. It looks something like this. So it goes through P and it's parallel to L. Uh, and there's uh, a unique line that does this. And that word unique is important here. Um, and it turns out to... Um, be extremely important it, so like you can't even leave out this this word here so so it turns out that um, that Euclid all right well let me say this so Euclid built up an axiomatic system for um, for geometry uh, I don't remember how many axioms there were but let's just say there were there were like 20 of them there's I don't think it was 20 it was um but like let's just say that there were 20 of them plus the axiom that we now know today as the parallel postulate so 21 total right uh people spent centuries trying to decide whether or not you could prove the parallel postulate from that original set of 20 other axioms everyone was convinced you could do it um but no one was able to until Beltrami, I don't even, I don't remember what year, um, Beltrami finally disproved it. Um, and, uh, and so when he, when he disproved it, the way that he did it was he actually constructed a model that used the first 20, um, the first 20 axioms. Um, that did not satisfy the parallel postulate. Um, and the one, the postulate, or the, he actually um, could replace the parallel postulate with, there exists infinitely many lines L prime 
uh, such that P lies in L prime and L prime is parallel to L. So uh, this is actually not quite how it's phrased. Uh, usually people actually phrase it as there exists more than one line L prime such that blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then from that, that actually turns out to be equivalent to this statement somehow. Um, don't worry too much about that. But that's sort of just like some of the history is that he was able to, um, he was able to create this model that satisfied all of Euclid's non-parallel postulate axioms. Um, but it broke this axiom right here, which showed that, um, the system that included the parallel postulate was actually independent because you can't prove the parallel postulate from the other things. Because if you could, then Belchami's uh, example never would have existed in the first place. So hugely important um, uh, thing from from uh, geometry, uh, very famous thing. Um, it, you you should definitely come out of your geometry class knowing this. So. Just wanted to throw that one out for you. Uh, interesting note, uh, both Euclidean and hyperbolic geometry have only one model. Um, we call an axiomatic system with only one model a categorical system. So that's, that's what the word means. Um, categorical means that there's only one system for that. So uh, Euclidean geometry, there's only one model for it and it's the one that we're all familiar with which is nice um and hyperbolic geometry actually has two very famous models um so there's uh which so like the first time that i read this i was actually confused about that because there are two models for it they are called the upper half plane model and the poincare disc model um but if I go back up to that thing that I was talking about before with these um, these four by four grids, it turns out it turns out that those two models look very different. Um, but for some notion of what it means for models to be the same, those two models are the same. Um, so hyperbolic geometry as well as Euclidean geometry only have one model up to that notion of what it means for things to be the same. And so they are both categorical systems. All right, I want to end this with an example. Uh, and I've been talking a little bit, so I think that it would be good for you to try this example on your own. Um, so please pause the video after um, we talk about what this says and give this a try, and then we will discuss it together. Um, all right, so the uh, the... Example is for you to decide if the axiomatic system below is categorical. So the undefined terms are member and committee, and the axioms are every committee has at least two members, and every member is on exactly one committee. So um, try to decide if this axiomatic system is categorical. Um, and when you have decided whether or not it is, uh, what I want you to think about a little bit more, uh, if you want, uh, if you're so interested to, is, is there an axiom that you could throw in here to make it categorical? Um, so there's probably a couple of different ways that you could do that. Um, but anyway, uh, pause the video, give that a shot, and when you're done, um, unpause and we will talk about it. All right, so um, now that you've had a chance to try this, uh, let's think about it. So um, the way to decide if this is categorical or not is we, well, we can show that it's not categorical if we can come up with two different models for it. All right, if I were to go back up to this axiomatic system, we actually proved that this is not categorical because we came up with two distinct uh, models for this system, right? So we want to come up with two different models for this axiomatic system to show that it is not categorical. Or, or we want to just come to the conclusion that there's no way that we could do uh, more than one uh, model for this system. So, um, 
So first off, how do, how do we interpret um, these undefined terms? So uh, the undefined terms are member and committee, right? Um, so we're gonna just like think of these as uh, people. We could, we could think of them as like points and lines or something like that. Um, but it might be easier to think of these as just like people and groups of people. So the members are gonna be um, people. Uh, I'm just gonna call the people um, by letters. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so on and so forth. Um, and then committees. So every committee has at least two members. Every member is on exactly one committee. Okay, all right, every committee has two members. So uh, I'll just like give the committees numbers, one, two, and three. Um, okay, so one thing that you could do is put A and B on committee one. So. So every committee has at least two members, so committee one has to have, like, it'll have A and B on there, okay? Uh, committee two will have C and D. Um, why did I do C and D? Why, why didn't I do, like, say, uh, C and B? Well, every member is on exactly one committee, um, so B cannot be on two of them, right? Uh, so we're gonna do C and D. Um, and then committee three will be E and F. Okay. Uh, and then I couldn't have a fourth committee because like if I only have six members here, um, I can't throw, uh, I can't throw like a and C onto here because then that would violate the second axiom. Every member is on exactly one committee. Um, so, so yeah, it has to be something like that. So, um, is this categorical? Well, no, so it is, it is not. So this is one interpretation of that. But another thing that you could do is you could, um, so you could increase the number of members and you could do a couple things with this. You could, so every committee has at least two members. That doesn't say like every committee has exactly two members. Um, so you could throw G and H both onto committee one. And if you do that, then this still satisfies both of these axioms. And that gives us a different uh, a different model and we could say that it's a different model because it has a different number of members and that's a pretty good distinguishing property between the two. Um, you could also have thrown uh, H onto this one right here or you could have even just come up with a fourth committee GH um, and so uh, all of those systems would be distinct, and so this would not be a categorical system. Um, all right, so is there a way to make it categorical? So let's move this down a little bit. Let's move this here. All right, well, what if I added the axiom... Um, there are exactly... Six members. Um, all right. Well, what if I did that? Let's see if that makes it categorical. So let's bring this. Let's bring this up a little bit. Hmm. All right, so we still have six members here. Um, so every member is on exactly one committee. Uh, this is still satisfied. All right, is there any other way that I could um, change this assigning of committees 
to uh, to have something different here. Um, well, you could uh, just get rid of the third com committee, so and then put E and F on the first committee, or you could put E on the first committee and F on the second one. Um, Okay, so that still doesn't work. Um, well, what else could we do to, to do this, um, to make this categorical? Well, um, one problem that we're noticing here is the words um, at least. So if we got rid of those words and just said uh, exactly every committee member has Sorry, every committee has exactly two members. Put that over here, so that makes more sense. Um, so if I did that, uh, then now this is a categorical system. So if every committee um, has exactly two members, every member is on exactly one committee, and there are exactly six members, then it would be a categor categorical, categorical system. Um, uh, because, so if I have six members, I can't do anything about that. Um, each member is on exactly one committee. Uh, need, need that to hold true. And every committee has uh, two members. Then each committee, well, would just be necessarily split into um, two, two, and two. And so there's nothing else that you could do with this.